All right, hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start on my review of Dolphin Song by Lauren St. John. So this is like a middle grade novel, really. Uh, I will read you the blurb before I go in. I'm going to share a few thoughts as well. Check out my tabs, and then share, share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. So before I do read the blurb, uh, the reason I picked this up is that I've kind of been tracking Lauren St. John in a way for a few years now, because um, she was one of the first authors I spoke to for my book blog, socialbookshelves.com. She actually contacted me and found my blog as a opposed to me contacting her as well, which I thought was quite cool. Uh, and so whenever I see her books going spare in like secondhand shops, charity shops and that sort of thing, I always go out of my way to pick them up to kind of, you know, keep up to date with what she's doing and show a little support. So I'm gonna find the blurb here. Um, yes, let's do that and the author bio as well. Then I'm gonna read some of my tabs. So, through the wild waves came 100 dolphins. They were leaping, dancing, cavorting, and their silvery arcs, outlined against the midnight ocean and stormy sky, were breathtakingly beautiful. When disaster strikes a school trip, Martine and her classmates are left fighting for their lives in shark-infested waters until dolphins guide them to a coral ring island. Here, the castaways, at odds with each other, must learn to survive. Will Martine's secret gift allow her to help both animals and humans when a deadly peril threatens them? And will those powers be with her when she needs them most? In this second African adventure, Martine's courage and bushcraft skills are tested to the limits as, marooned in the ocean, far from home, she wonders whether she will ever see her beloved white giraffe again. And we have Lawrence and John grew up in Zimbabwe, Africa, where she had a pet giraffe, as well as numerous dogs, horses and warthogs. She now lives in London with her two Mozambican cats. Dolphin Song is the sequel to the best-selling The White Giraffe, described by Publishing News as a spellbinding and mesmerising debut novel, and by The Times as a really charming and thrilling story, written with grace and poise. So let's go in and check out some of the tabs. It does have some like, illustrations and maps and stuff throughout that are worth, worth mentioning as well. And uh, you can, again, you can kind of see like the animal rights argument that Lawrence St. John herself would make. And I think that's a good thing because it gets kids thinking about them, you know, uh, such as this paragraph here. Martine was looking forward to the dolphins most of all. She'd only ever seen one dolphin in real life, and that was at a grim aquarium she'd visited with her equally grim former school, Bodley Brook. In a peeling swimming pool, a trainer had coaxed it into performing dozens of tricks with beach balls and rubber rings. Some of the children had been invited to reward it with fish from a bucket probably sardines, but Martine had kept her distance. When the dolphin approached the poolside, she'd noticed that its mouth was curled at the corners in a permanent smile. Throughout the show, she'd had the feeling that the dolphin was smiling only because it couldn't help it, like a clown smiling through tears. This, I just wanted to tab out because the previous owner has very cutely written high in the corner of that page. That made me smile. I thought this bit was quite sweet and well written. Uh, what do African islands look like, Alberto? Do they have thick bush on them and thorn trees, or, or are they white with palm trees? She was thinking of the island calendar in Grace's living room, which showed the Caribbean home of her father and his ancestors. All I know is that when I return from a long voyage and I see my home island, Benguera, my eyes feel peaceful, Alberto replied. Martine understood what he meant. She experienced the same sensation whenever she passed through the gates of Sao Bona, but the Bazarutu archipelago was nothing like the golden wave in grassland, thickets of acacia, and herds of zebra and elephant in the place that made her own eyes feel peaceful. Alberto conjured up images of palm fringe islands scattered like snowy teardrops across a turquoise lagoon. In centuries past, he said, when it was the bountiful southern tip of the trading routes of Arabia, the Queen of Sheba had made the islands her personal playground. And, um... This is something that the author clearly feels quite passionately about and she actually comes back to this at the end, uh, there's um, like a postscript that she writes. But uh, yeah, this is the, you know, the equivalent of it in the book. Um, I'm just going to read this chunk of dialogue. Um, she called him Mr. Manning one afternoon to ask him why dolphins and whales beached themselves. Mr. Manning was not a man who did anything speedily and it took him a while to answer. He removed his spectacles, which had, which had a chipped lens and a broken arm he had mended himself with yellow insulation tape, and wiped sea spray off the lenses. To be honest, Martine, he said, it's a bit of a mystery. Sometimes it has an obvious cause, such as dolphins being wounded by fishing gear, or bite wounds from sharks, or being ill. 
But when large numbers of dolphins and whales are involved, it's not that simple. Alberto was telling me that in the Bazarutu Islands, dolphins have beached themselves on the 13th day of each of the past three months. Some songa believe that it's because the dolphins have become drunk on rainwater and around the world other cultures have their own ideas. But many scientists are now coming round to the theory that one of the main causes is sonar. Sonar? You mean the things ships use to communicate with each other? Exactly. Sound navigation and ranging is its full name. It was invented in 1906 by a man called Lewis Nixon as a way of detecting icebergs and then modified by a French physicist and a Russian engineer for use in detecting submarines during the First World War. These days, of course, sonar is used extensively by the Navy for military purposes and many other people and organisations for all sorts of other things. For instance, fishermen use it to find shoals of fish. The sea kestrel was steaming through the waves in response to a supposed Stardine run sighting and Martine and Mr Manning moved back from the railings to avoid the flying spray. I don't understand, said Martine. Why would that cause dolphins and whales to want to escape the sea? Ah, well, you see, whales and dolphins use a kind of sonar to locate prey and find their way around the oceans. It's known as echolocation. Scientists fear that the low-frequency active LFA sonar used by the Navy disorientates and confuses them. It sweeps the ocean like a sort of floodlight and the sound it gives off can carry up to 100 miles and be as loud as a fighter jet at takeoff. In some cases, it can cause whales to surface too quickly, leading to a fatal condition similar to the bends in human beings. They get gas bubbles in their organs. Their brains bleed. Sometimes the sonar is so deafening that it bursts their eardrums. A few years ago, LFA testing in the Bahamas was found to be responsible for the stranding of 16 whales, seven of which were found dead. There have been numerous similar incidents across the planet, often where there have been naval exercises in the area. The total number of cases runs into thousands. 300 dolphins in Zanzibar, 130 pilot whales in, Tanz 130 pilot whales in Tasmania, 68 dolphins in Florida. There's an unnecessary apostrophe in uh, girds full of water, G-O-U-R-D-S. I can't judge too harshly because I don't even know how to pronounce that word, but yeah. And uh, we have this kind of conversation between uh, the main character, Martine, and a bully. Um, he says, um, he says, I decided to pretend their story was mine. I spend a lot of time watching TV in hotel rooms when my mum and dad are out at cocktail parties with their rich and famous friends. Those kinds of people don't like kids around, especially fat ones. Martine pictured her own life at Sawabona. The campfire breakfast with Tendai where he would talk to her about bushcraft and Zulu legends. The newly cut grass scent of Jemmy and the feel of his whiskers when he nuzzled her. The homely evenings with her grandmother when they'd celebrate the successful rehabilitation of a sanctuary orphan with a special African dinner. She realised then how fortunate she was. Yes, she'd lost her parents, but they'd given her more love than many people had from families who were with them for a lifetime. And her grandmother constantly showed Martine that she cared with actions, even if she couldn't always do it with words. Is that why, why you're not very nice to us? She asked Claudius. Because you're unhappy. Is that why I bully you, you mean? You can say it. No. I give you a hard time because you're the opposite of me. Because I envy you. Because your life seems so simple. And because you don't seem to want or need anything apart from your white giraffe and your friends at Sawabona. Because even though Ben doesn't speak, it's obvious that you're there for each other. You care for each other. And that's what he doesn't have. He just doesn't have anyone who's got his back. And then we get this bit as well where um, we're coming back to these, these sonar things and we have this conversation. If scientists know that, why do the Navy still use it? Sherilyn asked. Grown-ups don't always fix the obvious things, Nathan told her. That's because they're so busy telling us not to eat too many sweets or run in the house or talk to strangers or stand under trees when there's lightning. They don't have time, Lucy remarked. And uh, Ben gets asked why he why never speaks at school. And he says, a long time ago, I read this Buddhist quote, say nothing that doesn't improve on silence. That's, um, is it Buddhist? Because I'm familiar with that concept through Stoicism. I thought this was a very specific example here, but kind of funny. Ben, Martine asked, do you think that when you're really afraid of things, you sort of attract them? I mean, you know how girls who are afraid of bats are always ending up with bats getting caught in the hair, while people who couldn't care less about them go their whole lives without seeing a single one. Well, I have a phobia about deep water and I seem to keep getting into situations where I have to face it. It is, I mean, it is true. I, don't, I suppose it is very rare for bats actually to get stuck in your hair, but you see it in movies a lot. Some advice here of uh, never go to sleep on an argument. Good life advice, I, I, I guess. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't argue, really. 
I just refused to get drawn into the argument in the first place. And then just this final bit I wanted to read here. This is actually the outro here to her afterward. She says, there are five main islands in the Bazaruto Archipelago, so I hope the Mozambicans won't mind that I have taken the liberty of adding a sixth, Dugong, for the purposes of my story. However, the Death Island Sandbar and other islands mentioned, Bengura, Bazaruta and Santa Carolina, with its eerie abandoned hotel which I explored, all exist. They are a true African paradise. The sand is so clean that it squeaks when you walk, the water is aquamarine, and the islanders are extremely proud that their islands are friendly and free of crime. The islands also happen to be home to several hundred strong pods of dolphins. Late one afternoon, a boatman took me out in a rubber dinghy to look for them. We found them close to the reef hunting shoals of little fish. The sight of their lithe, graceful bodies glinting in the clear water as they darted like quicksilver all around us, surfacing periodically to take a puff of oxygen, was beyond beautiful. This time I felt no urge to swim with them. I was content to watch dolphins at play in their natural environment. Dolphins left alone to be free. I prayed that sonar testing would never find its way to the Bazaruto Islands as it does in Dolphin Song. Writing this book and being able to spend months immersed in a world of dolphins was one of the best experiences of my life. In Dolphin Song, Martine's gift allows her and her friends to help 21 beach dolphins and return all but one to the sea. In real life, Dolphins and whales rely on marine welfare organisations and ordinary people like you and me to take an interest in them and try to protect them. We only have one planet, let's do our best to care for it. So overall, I did enjoy this, uh, it was uh, cracking, uh, you know, it's not really aimed at me, it's more aimed at sort of teenage girls I guess, but I really enjoy the messages behind it, I thought it was quite beautifully written in places, and also this was 2007 and I know from reading more of St John's books since then that she's just got even better as well. So yeah, I did enjoy it, would recommend. So there we have it, I gave Dolphin Song by Lawrence and John 3.5 out of 5. So as always, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit that subscribe button for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye.